Hello everyone and welcome back to Space Basics. In this video I'm going to talk about how rockets work fundamentally and this will include the concepts of delta V and specific impulse which you, you will hear a lot of when people are discussing space things because they are critically important to getting to where you're going in space. So yes, we will cover those but I'm not going to talk about how rocket engines specifically provide the thrust necessary to go from place to place. That will be the next video. So this is just uh, basic fundamental stuff and uh, to some extent it's trying to get us to understand how things move in space as opposed to how they move on the ground or in the air because people do get hung up on the fact that things on the ground need something to push against or in the air they need to have air passing over the wings or something like that. Um, in space you don't need that. Basically vehicles that you're used to are working with the forces that they are subjected to. So on the ground, our cars work with friction. They have traction on the ground. Traction is making use of friction in order to maneuver around things. And in the air, of course, aerodynamics makes use of aerodynamic drag. Uh, basically, the drag is getting turned into lift. And uh, when you think about stuff like Sailboats. Sailboats are actually making use of aerodynamic drag. Uh, it's, it's weird, they're not flying through the air, but the sails are actually using drag in order to push the boat. Uh, so, but we don't have those forces in space. What we are working with is gravity, and in the previous video I talked about how the spacecraft move along in space to sort of work with gravity instead of against it. And so they pick paths in space to uh, ensure that it is the minimum energy that they need to stay or go where they're going. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about what fundamental aspect of physics that the rockets do use to move around because they don't have drag or friction or something like that. And the key is the law of conservation of momentum. You may have heard of the law of conservation of mass energy or just mass, uh, but uh, because of E equals mc squared and the fact that mass can be converted into energy, it's actually mass energy. So there's the law of conservation of mass energy, and then there's the law of conservation of momentum. These are fundamental laws of physics. And momentum is mass times velocity. So that's it. And normally momentum is labeled p, small p, but it's really annoying because small p can also be pressure. And sometimes it also gets confused with rho, which is sort of like a small p, which is density. So we've got a lot of things that are p. But anyway, a mass times velocity is conserved for any system. If we imagine this spacecraft right here that we have in front of us is just sitting uh, still in a frame of reference. So we're looking at there's no forces on it. It's just at zero. That means in this frame of reference, it is at zero velocity. Uh, frames of reference is a whole other discussion, but let's just pretend it is uh, at zero velocity. So that means it's, its momentum is zero, right? Because whatever its mass is, as long as its velocity is zero, its momentum is zero in that frame of reference. Note that uh, the conservation only occurs in a certain frame of reference. Uh, so if you're looking at it from a different point of view, it will be conserved in a different way. It'll still be conserved, but you have to take that into account. You can't change frames of reference and still expect the numbers to work out. So anyway, this is sitting still. It is, uh, and then we're not concerned about how the rocket engine works. So what I want you to pretend is that this is a two ton thing and it's one ton of spaceship and one ton of propellant just for the simplicity of math. Okay, one ton of spaceship, one ton of propellant and part of the one ton of spaceship is the Hulk. And the Hulk is going to throw out the one ton of propellant immediately. So one ton of propellant is going to be shot out the back. And it is going to be shot out the back. Let's uh, pick a more reasonable speed. 100 meters per second. Okay. That, so that's the mass and that's the velocity. That's going to be shot out the back and the Hulk is just throwing it out. That's it. Now, this produces a recoil because we have to keep the zero momentum. That means that there is a recoil in the opposite direction. And we have a one ton craft. And the recoil has to be 100 meters per second. 
And that will include the Hulk himself or herself. Uh, she is a She-Hulk. Anyway, but anyway, uh, so this is all uh, conserved. And so what you get is there's one mass and one velocity. This is actually just sum over masses and velocities. Uh, we simplified because we only had one thing, but now we have two things. We have this thing and we have that thing. And so it's the sum of the two. So mass one and times velocity one plus mass two and velocity two. And the thing you have to remember about velocity is it has direction. Okay, the direction matters with velocity. It's not just a number. It's a vector. And vectors are a number plus a direction. So if the directions cancel out, in this case they do, as long as the... You, you can think of the vectors as how long the arrow is and what direction they're pointing in. So a 50 meter per second arrow might be this long and a 100 meter per second arrow might be this long. And as long as the two arrows cancel out, so there's a 100 meter per second arrow this way and a 100 meter per second arrow that way, then these two cancel out and end up at zero. So uh, vectors can cancel out like that. And velocity is a vector. So remember that. And let me just get rid of these just for clarity. So this is the law of conservation of momentum. This is how rockets work in space. There's nothing about pushing against anything. There's nothing about how you're pushing the stuff out the tail. However you push the stuff out the tail, uh, it'll still do the same thing. You have a recoil in the opposite direction. Now, there's two numbers here that are going to be fundamental to talking about how the stuff works. This number, the speed at which we uh, shoot the stuff out at, we are going to call the exhaust velocity. Let me try and write that with my mouse as clearly as possible. Exhaust velocity. Now, in this case, with the Hulk throwing it out, it was instantaneous. That's instantaneous acceleration. Generally, we don't want that, and nor do we get it with rockets. Rockets are constantly, not constantly, but through a burn, which is usually a few minutes, they'll throw out stuff out the back at a fairly constant rate. Um, once they get up to the speed that they need to get up to, they'll shut the engine down. It only takes a few minutes to do any particular burn unless you're with an ion engine. Ion engines are a different kind of engine that take longer, but they still have an exhaust velocity. It still works the same. They have a mass that's, that's getting thrown out and an exhaust velocity. Uh, this number over here is the delta V. So delta V means literally change in velocity. That's the change in the spacecraft's velocity. So uh, if the spacecraft was lighter, or let's say uh, the Hulk threw uh, heavier mass out. Let's say it was two tons here. Well, if it's two tons being thrown out at 100 meters per second and it's still a one ton spacecraft, then the delta V has to be 200 meters per second to balance, right? Because we're just multiplying these numbers. This is 200, this has to be 200. So the more stuff we throw out the back, this is the propellant mass, uh, the faster we go, or the faster we throw the stuff out, the faster we go. So this, effectively, the exhaust velocity is our efficiency. So instead of carrying so much propellant, instead of carrying a whole load of stuff for the Hulk to throw out, uh, we are going to try and throw the stuff out faster. And the faster we throw the stuff out, the faster we go without using as much propellant. So exhaust velocity and efficiency are the same thing. And now, you won't hear, if you're watching like Kerbal Space Program videos or something like that, you won't hear exhaust velocity very much. You're going to hear a term ISP or specific impulse. Uh, specific impulse is just a way to get rid of the units for exhaust velocity. Otherwise, some people are going to be measuring it in feet per second. Some people are going to be, that NASA in the 1960s used feet per second a lot. Uh, some people use like miles an hour meters per second, and it goes on and on like that. So to get rid of the differences between the units, what people do is they take the exhaust velocity and they divide it by gravity, gravity in whatever units you're using. And in this case, if it was uh, metric, it's metric right now, it'd be 9.81 meters per second squared. And the result of dividing by gravity, no matter what units you're, make, you're using, is to get a number in seconds. In this case, it would be roughly 10 seconds. 
and that is the ISP. The ISP is just taking that exhaust velocity, dividing it by gravity and whatever units you have, and getting a number in seconds. And everybody uses seconds. It doesn't matter what unit system you are. So then seconds is something that we can all understand and talk about without messing up with our units. That's all. So that's what the specific impulse is. There is another reason for specific impulse we'll get to later, but this is basically what specific impulse is. So, yeah, if you, in Kerbal Space Program, if you take the specific impulse and multiply by 10, close enough to 9.81, you'll be getting the exhaust velocity. Okay, so this is sort of messy, but as we said, it isn't really the Hulk throwing something out immediately, right? It's stuff, a smaller amount of stuff coming out constantly. So how do we deal with that? Well, um... Let's let's imagine, let's just imagine that we have a one-ton craft again. And let's imagine um, the actual rocket engine, but we have a total of, well, let's make it a little bit easier. Um, let's go with one-ton craft and five tons of propellant. But we'll only shoot one ton of propellant out every second, okay? So, five tons of propellant. And we'll shoot it out at, uh, let's make it a nice 1,000 meters per second now, really fast. Because the engines we use will get even better than this, right? Because it's not the Hulk throwing it out. 100 meters per second is like 200 miles an hour. This is like 2,200 miles an hour. And real rocket engines normally uh, shoot stuff out at about 3,000 to 4,500 meters per second. So that's what they actually do. And that's because of the way they work. And if you had something that was working differently, it could have weaker weaker exhaust velocity or stronger exhaust velocity. But anyway, we have this five tons and we're gonna shoot it out at 1,000 meters per second and see where we get. But for the first ton we shoot out, that's still pushing five tons on this side, right? It's four, uh, one ton of spacecraft plus the remaining four tons of propellant. Right? So it's a total of 5 tons. So that 1 ton of, uh, going at 1,000 meters per second that we shoot out in second number 1 is doing five, uh, 5 tons. So the speed that we have here is going to be 200 meters per second. So that's the delta V for second number 1. Second number 2, we'll have 4 tons here. We lost 1 ton already. And... We're going to have one more ton shooting out at 1,000 meters per second, right? So this is, uh, then there's three tons remaining, and then we get 250 meters per second of delta V. Because, so here it was pushing five tons. Here, the one ton is pushing four tons. And then it's pushing 3 tons, so we'll get 333 meters per second in the next second. And then there's 2 tons that it's pushing, then we'll get 500 meters per second. And for the 5th ton, the last ton that we have there, finally the spacecraft is only 1 ton, so 1,000 meters per second. Now, of course, it's not discrete like this. It, it's supposed to be continuous. We've still cut it into discrete chunks. But what you end up getting is a curve. And uh, I'm going to draw the curve backwards for a reason. We're going to draw it like the way we loaded the propellant in. So the last ton in was... Uh, the first ton into the tank is the last ton out. So the first ton into the tank was uh, this one, so this is one uh, one ton right here, and it gave us 1,000. The next ton into the tank gave us 500. The next ton in the tank gave us 333. And the next ton in the tank gave us less 250 and so forth. So you get this curve that is diminishing. And so that's an important thing in as far as spacecrafts are concerned. We don't want to overload the tanks, okay? But eventually you get this curve, so even if we cut it down to little, littler pieces, 
and uh, talk about, okay, 0.1 ton and maybe a tenth of a second or something like that, you're still going to get this curve. And this is a natural log curve, or LN. And this is something that occurs in nature a whole lot. And it's the opposite of an exponential curve. Uh, so exponential curve will go like that. And then natural log curve will go the other way. So let me just focus on the natural log curve because it's going to be important for what we're talking about. Okay, so the natural log curve, like this, has diminishing returns for every new ton you put in. However, it sort of gets reset when you have a new stage because this only matters for this. Remember, we were saying one ton of dry mass for the spacecraft, right? But let's say you also have a different stage. So there's one ton and we had five tons of propellant. But let's say we had a different stage below it, a big rocket down here. And this had 10 tons of dry mass. And then maybe 16 tons, including the stuff up here. And it had 50 tons of propellant. Well, the curve for this stage is separate from the curve for this stage. And that's why we get rocket stages. And normally it takes about two to get to orbit. And then you might have another stage to get somewhere else. So the, the basic idea for this video is that the rockets don't need anything to work up against because they're using the conservation of momentum. And the conservation momentum, it looks, it works like a bottle rocket, basically. I mean, uh, you build up pressure in a water bottle and you, or not a water bottle, like, like a soda bottle, you shake it up and you have bubbles forming and everything and that increases the pressure inside and you let go of the cap and it shoots out and the, the rocket, the plastic bottle shoots the opposite direction. It's all about recoil and you get diminishing returns and the equation to represent how much actual delta V you get. Remember, delta V is a change in velocity of the spacecraft, and it is directly related to the exhaust velocity. But the equation for it is the delta V equals the exhaust velocity. But then we have to have some term to deal with the mass, right? Because as the mass of the stuff going out increases, the delta V increases for the, for the spacecraft, or if you're shooting out only a little bit, then you're not going to get that much change in velocity. And change in velocity is the important thing because we're going to keep going in the direction we're going, so nothing is going to stop us, uh, basically. I mean, the, the tiny, tiny little things. Of course, gravity is going to pull us in one direction or another, but nothing's going to stop us. So our range is effectively infinite. Delta V, how much we can change our velocity determines where we can go in space. So delta V is the thing that we're going to be most interested in. It, uh, to get into orbit, we need 7,800 meters per second uh, to make orbital velocity, though normally we pack 9,500 to beat uh, gravity and aerodynamics. So that's the number that we would write in here to figure out how much we need, but we need some term for the mass of the vessel and for the propellant. And the term we have is LN, that's that curve, the natural log curve. And we have the vessel with fuel, or um, the initial mass, the start mass, before we do the burn, divided by the end mass, after we do the burn. After we shoot the stuff out the back, that mass, however, however much that is. So if we decide to shoot one ton out, so what we would do is, let's say our initial mass, we're one ton of spaceship plus five tons of propellant, so six tons, and we shoot one ton out the back. Well, now we have five tons left. So it's six over five. Then on your calculator, because you're not going to do natural logarithms in your head, Hopefully you have a calculator that has an LN button. You do LN, 6 divided by 5, multiply by the exhaust velocity, and then you get the delta V. Now, in Kerbal Space Program, the place where I'm demonstrating this, uh, you will have engines. Let me clear all this stuff up. Uh, I will talk about that equation one more time. That's going to be the most important equation that you're going to deal with. It's called the rocket equation. So it's important. Uh, we need a rocket engine. 
So you see this engine ISP here. And remember the ISP is the specific impulse. I know there's a lot of stuff. But the engine ISP is a specific impulse, which means it's the sort of simplified version of the exhaust velocity. And this particular engine, the E1, says that in vacuum, and not at sea level, ASL is sea level, 290 is in vacuum. It says that in vacuum it gets 290 specific impulse. But uh, to get the exhaust velocity, we have to do 290 times gravity. And these units are, uh, we normally work with metric units in here. So it'll be 9.81. Or to a good approximation, this is 2,900 meters per second. You'll, if you want it to be exact, exact, uh, you'll need to use a calculator. So this particular engine is not great. It gets 2,900 meters per second exhaust velocity. Again, that's the speed of the stuff going out the back. So you can just add a zero to it, and that will be your answer for that amount. Now then we can work with the equation and figure out our delta v. So the rocket equation, delta v equals that 2,900. Again, which you look at any of the engines in here, you can find. And then the natural log of your initial mass divided by your end mass. So what do we need? Let's say we were transferring to the moon. Well, then we need 3,200 to get over to the moon. We're going to divide this 2,900. So that equals the ln of that stuff, which I'll just say m0 over m1. So uh, initial mass is often written m0, and n mass can be written m1 or some other thing. So m0 over m1, just for shorthand. And how do you get rid of this ln on your calculator then? Well, to get rid of the ln in your calculator, uh, because we, we want to find, we'll, we'll probably know our initial mass, but we want to figure out what our end mass is going to be or how much repellent we're going to burn. Then we do the e to the ln. So we multiply this side by e to the that. But this might be too much for you guys at this point. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of math. But the rocket equation is the main math that you're going to be working with as far as all space things. So if you can just remember that, and let's go over it again. Delta V equals the exhaust velocity. And for our purposes in here, that will be ISP times 9.81. If you were using other units, if... For instance, like you're in NASA and using feet per second, it would be ISP in feet per second times 32 uh, feet per second squared. But we don't like those units. <laughs> um, exhaust velocity times the ln of the initial mass divided by the final mass. Just remember that. I know. But for all these engines... Oh, that's a big one. Uh, for all these engines, you're going to have this ISP number, and so the higher the number, the more efficient it is. And it is simply a matter of it shooting the stuff out the back faster. That's what it is. That's the entire efficiency of the engine. So, given that, we are going to talk in the next video about how the rocket engines actually work and how they get the efficiency that they do, and all about thrust, and yes, but... Let me, let me just emphasize that this, your ability to understand this particular equation, the rocket equation, is uh, key to all your space endeavors. And it is just algebra, rearranging this equation. Uh, proving that it is correct would be like something like calculus, but you don't have to prove that it's correct, you just have to work with it. And it is all based on the conservation of momentum. It is mass times velocity on one side equals mass times velocity on the other side, this way and that way. Okay, so given that, uh, we will go over how chemical rocket engines work in the next video. Thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.